Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is January 12th, 2010, and my guest is Mike Munger of Duke University, longtime friend of this program. Mike, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's great to be back. Our format today is a little unusual. Uh, I solicited questions from listeners via our Twitter account, Econ Talker, and also via my blog, Cafe Hayek. Uh, Questions that listeners would like to hear Mike Munger talk about. And I picked, with your help, Mike, we picked the 10 most interesting questions. Uh, I may mess up who asked them. I apologize in advance. Um, And what we're going to do is we're going to have a weird little format here. We're going to try to limit our answers to each of the questions to six minutes. I have a timer here, so when you hear the bell go off, Mike, you have to finish your sentence. And if the bell doesn't go off because my timer is imperfect, uh, we're going to have to... uh, I'll just finish my sentence anyway. Exactly. I will just cut you off. Yeah. So uh, here we go. I'm going to set the timer. Wait a minute. I'm going to wind it up here. And and, and then we're off. Um, first question is from Craig Morgan, who heard a story on National Public Radio about freshwater scarcity threatening mankind. Um, and he made a remark. It could be a joke. I'm not sure about peak water. <laughs> like we might run out of water. Uh, but I think there's no question that water – is very scarce and it is an important resource. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, it is a bit different from peak oil, which is the analogy. It's a it's a great one. And after all, we use up petroleum. We change it chemically when we use it. Water, we don't use it up. We just sort of render it temporarily icky. Or maybe we spread it on uh, agricultural land and it evaporates. But the, the, the basic amount of water is still the same in the world. And it gets we have a good desalinization uh, tool called the sun that brings a bunch of water up out of the ocean and then deposits it over land. The the reason we have so much scarcity of water is that we we do a strange thing. Let's separate two things. First, potable drinking water that we've gotten from somewhere and then storm runoff. An interesting thing, and if you talk to somebody in in cities, they, they won't admit this at first, but all cities, all cities in the United States and Europe even, if there's a heavy rain, then their stormwater runs into their sanitation system, and both of those go directly untreated into rivers. We can't manage all the runoff. So part of the problem is we treat water not as a resource, but as runoff. It's as if it were garbage. How are we going to get rid of it in the most efficient way? Second problem we have is human feces is basically toxic waste. Even a tiny amount of it can make a big quantity of water, not only unusable, but almost a bioweapon. So what do we do? We take clean, potable water straight from the same system that runs our tap, our dishwasher, and our ice cube maker, and we combine it with human feces. And then we spend literally billions of dollars to treat it. We try to take that back out of the water so we can get back to the clean, potable water we began with. There's a a book about two years old by a woman named Rose George called The Big Necessity, where she analyzes sanitation all over the world. And it, it, it opened my eyes in so many ways reading the book. Partly it just it sort of makes you scared about different societies. Some cultures are fecophilic and some cultures are fecophobic. This but, podcast never ceases to educate, does it? <laughs> First we have the word potable, which is uh, drinkable for those of you yeah, out there. Yeah, you, you drink uh, it won't make you sick. And, and now we have fecophobic and fecophilic. Yep. Are they in the dictionary? Oh, absolutely. Okay, go ahead. Well, so uh, China and a lot of Southeast Asia uses human feces for all kinds of uh, uh, fertilizer, and it is valuable in a sense. It contains a lot of nutrients. It also contains E. coli and some things that are absolutely deadly. And then places like India, the U.S., Europe, they're fecophobic in the sense they, they try to avoid it, flush it away, deny it. Both of them really have it wrong. And so what, what we need to do is rethink, and here's my main question to Craig, the problem is not a scarcity of fresh water. The problem is we've not dealt with the problem of human waste and keeping it separate from the water system. That's what we have to confront. But, but we do a pretty good job in the United States with that. I mean, occasionally we have a, we pour a tragedy. water into it. What? We pour 
pour water into it. We waste, instead of saying, how are we going to deal with this, we have a waterborne sanitation system and then say we have a shortage. Now, I agree our sanitation system works well, but our water system does not. We have shortages. Now and then, yes. Uh, and uh, as I think we learned in a podcast with Richard McKenzie, uh, people think that there's a shortage of water in Southern California because it doesn't rain very much. But uh, there's also a, no shortage of uh, Mercedes or Jaguars yeah. in Southern California. And, and they don't rain either. They don't rain either. So it's not just natural causes. It's the price system and the way we organize that. But, but the point I want to ask, as we tick down and get about oh, maybe two minutes left, in poor, poorer societies, uh, whether they are fecophilic or fecophobic, you know, by the way, my daughter's starting to study for SATs, and I, I can't wait to share those two words <laughs> with her because they're commonly found on SAT exams. Yeah. Um, in poorer societies, regardless of their cultural issues, they struggle to um, deliver clean water through, yeah. through the public sector. And there's a big issue of whether the private sector can do better uh-huh. uh, through privatization. Do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. But what, what the public sector do. should focus on is sanitary handling of human waste. If they do that, then the private sector could deliver clean, potable water. The problem is that the water is so contaminated that we end up having to spend a whole lot of money, not very effectively, frankly, on trying to clean up the water. So if we focused on a public good would be getting rid of human waste, like most trash, most of the, it, we're avoiding a public bad. There you have to have some sort of restriction. Water is a commodity like any other. Private systems could deliver that. But is that... Is the waste treatment the, the central issue that's facing those poor societies? This book by Rose George convinced me, yes. We shouldn't even talk about water. We should talk about waste treatment because if you do that, there's all sorts of sources of water that would be safe. And so what mistake have we made in, in treatment of, of waste? Um, the, the, the gold standard is a ceramic toilet inside your house that uses waterborne sanitation. And we try to approximate that instead of... Well, in China now, a, a number of places are using effectively uh, dry uh, biological systems that also produce a, a clean methane gas that you can use to cook with. And it never touches the water because it's self-contained just below the house. And it's, e each of these provides a very significant amount of gas. There's no reason to take it away from the house. What you want to do is control odor and control uh, contact with germs. But there's no reason you should use huge amounts of water to wash it miles away so it can be treated and separate the water back out. Okay, well, we're out of time. We're going to question number two here. Question number two is from Stephen and TX Sir, who ask about bubbles in our current economy. There's a lot of focus these days on bubbles, uh, asset bubbles, stock market bubbles, housing bubbles. And... Um, the economics profession has not done a very good job, I think, dealing with bubbles. What, are your, what is your take on them? Uh, can we identify them? Should we try to do something about them? What do we know about them? I'd like to – I'm a neoclassical economist, and I, I tend to think of markets as being able to handle things. And to some extent, they can handle them pretty well. But Adam Smith, when he talked about, as you know better than anyone, animal spirits. Adam Smith talked about animal spirits? <laughs> It would be that John Maynard Keynes guy I was thinking yeah, of. Yeah, they're so similar. <laughs> they were both bipeds. Yes. <laughs> and they both had books. I don't see why you're quibbling. I think they both were uh, from the British Isles. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. They both spoke with an accent. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> John, John Maynard Keynes, who talked about animal spirits and sort of group psychology. And he used, famously used the, the example of that investing didn't have much to do with underlying fundamentals. It was more like a beauty contest where your objective was not to say – which person you thought was the most beautiful. It was to say who you thought everyone else would think was the most beautiful. And so what, it, there's nothing about underlying fundamentals or actual judgment. It's just a kind of group psychology, which is not much different from a mob. What do you think of that? Well, I, I want to think it's false. I want to think it's just wrong. But it turns out Vernon Smith and Charlie Plott, both of whom, in terms of their own personal political ideologies, would not necessarily be big fans of Keynes, have managed to replicate something like bubbles in laboratory experiments. And the way it works is this. You have Charlie Plott had thousands of people at computer terminals all over the world. 
so that knowing they could communicate with each other, but they were supposed to buy and sell uh, derivatives, options, basically, an underlying asset. And the rule was, let's say, that uh, the underlying asset had a certain value and it would fluctuate, but they all knew that the value of this asset would go to zero at time 30, so a month from now in the experiment. And his question was, what would happen to the, the value of the options? And they should go to zero, too, once the value of the asset goes to zero. But it turns out, for at least five or six periods, after everyone knows the value of the underlying asset has gone to zero, they're still trading in these options. Some people buy them. And it's not surprising somebody sells them. Of course somebody wants to sell them. What's surprising is somebody will still buy them. And why did they buy them? Because they're foolish. They bought them because they thought they could still make money, and they were right until they were the last ones holding it. Yeah, so that's the Ponzi scheme chain letter aspect of investing that is... But Ponzi seems like a fraud. This is where everybody knew. So it, it is the surprising thing, is, and the thing that I want to deny, is that something like animal spirits may actually count in these kinds of bubbles. Well, I don't have any problem with that. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think there's any doubt that animal spirits play some role. We, we don't have a theory of animal spirits is the problem. For those who want to put bubbles at the center of, say, the investing phenomenon, they want to get rid of the efficient markets hypothesis, and they want to bring behavioral economics and, and bubbles into the – as the default. I, I think that's a pretty empty um, oh, yeah. empty box is the yeah. problem. And the, the, the thing about the bubble that we just saw was that it was what an Austrian economist would call – I'm not going to even say a name unless I get it wrong – but what an Austrian economist – might call an asset inflation. And that asset inflation was caused in part by having the wrong signal about the cost of funds. The, the, the uh, Fed funds rate was too low. Interest rates were too low. It was well below what would be implied by the Taylor Rule from uh, John Taylor at, uh, at Stanford University, someone that you've interviewed elsewhere. For. Yeah, and here talking about the – he's talked about the Taylor Rule. Yeah. Well, so we've the, – the, the Taylor Rule is, is a uh, – an estimate, a formula for saying what interest rates should be given the apparent scarcity of funds, and the uh, the Fed funds rate or the, the rates that were set by the Federal Reserve were less than half that, which meant that investors were given a signal saying you should invest a lot of money because you can make a lot of money in housing, but it was artificial. It was low. So I think that's at least as good an explanation as animal spirits because that tells you People were misallocating resources. We get way too much money in the capital stock, in the housing stock, as a result of that misallocation. It has real effects. Yeah, just to put note what you just said, it's it, they made it very cheap to borrow as yeah. a way of financing uh, longer term investments, um, cheaper than they than they uh, would have been otherwise. So the question is then, do you think? Um, I mean, here's the problem I have with it. It, it seems that. Everybody's really good at identifying what they want to call a bubble after it's broken. There's not very many people who are very good at identifying it before. Even the housing bubble, very smart so-called housing. I don't even know if it was real. I do know that we artificially increased investment in housing through monetary policy and other methods, which we'll talk about in a different question coming up in a little bit. But uh, it, even at the time – uh, the, the so obvious bubble, there were a lot of really smart people who said it might be due to fundamentals. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, the, these values are subjective. And since I am a thoroughgoing subjectivist when it comes to pricing, I, I don't think I know how much a house should cost. It depends in part on how much someone will pay for it. And the insight I have to grant Keynes is that partly depends on how much you think other people will pay for it. So it, there, there is something to... The, the beauty contest analogy, but that's not the same thing as uh, some sort of mass psychology mania. There's a rational basis for that. Yeah, and, and they do seem to, re- prices do seem to, even for assets, do seem to return to fundamentals. Okay, yeah. let's move on. Question number three. Uh, Agnostic asks, there's been an explosion in compassionate food, grass-fed beef, free-range eggs, butter from pastured cows, um, and on the sides of the packaging of these products, there's little stories about how nicely they treat their animals. Uh, what do you think of the strengths and weaknesses of this bottom-up market solution to the humane treatment of animals as compared to top-down regulation by the state? This is a question that I wish I had an hour 
to, to talk about. I'll give you six minutes, okay? It, it, does, it touches on... Uh, I have as long as I want to talk about it. I only get to be on the tape for six That's minutes. Right. That's right. Um, <laughs> I've had a lot of arguments with vegetarians, for example. Are you a vegetarian? I am not a vegetarian, as it happens. I'm not either. Um, but my wife and daughter are, by the well, way. Well, so then the, one, of the, one of the things that they say, what the vegetarians say, is that it's, it's exploitation of the animals. Now, I believe they, that means, from a utilitarian perspective, they're claiming it would be better if the animal had never been born, because I've spent some time some time around cattle and chickens, and they're, they're not that great as pets. Probably Although, the only reason we have so many cattle and chickens is that people expect to use them to eat or for milk or for eggs or the, the sort of things that people object to for exploitation. So I, I was up uh, in Montana once, and there's this beautiful mountain meadow, and in this meadow were <clears throat> five beautiful cows and one extremely happy-looking bull. <laughs> And it struck me that w- what an idyllic setting. And, and in fact, if you were to design cow and bull heaven, that's what it would look like. And somebody was paying for them to be there. Why? Because they love cattle? No, because they want to sell them for profit. Well, it, the fact is that setting, if, I might have been able to sell them for extra if I could take a picture of it. So maybe there is something to this. Uh, th- this idea that people might pay more for free range or happy cattle. They think it tastes better. They think it has fewer enzymes. It's mainly but, psychological. I don't think it's the taste or the health benefits. I think it's the the idea that they want to be they don't want to be part of something that's cruel. And that gets us to the sort of Peter Singer utilitarian argument. It's not obvious that it really is true that if those cows had never been born, they'd be better off. Just the fact that their life ends at the point where they go into an abattoir and have their that's lives a slaughter taken ho- away. That's a slaughterhouse for you SAT students out there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you, give you SAT students this all is, your money's worth. This is too highbrow a podcast, Mike, I think. Go ahead, keep going. <laughs> all right, so when they kill them cows, yeah. uh, and maybe they do it in a kosher way. Maybe they, maybe they do it yeah. in a way to, to make it possible for people who keep kosher. They, they, they can eat that meat. It, it, it's really hard for me to believe that it would have been better for those cows never to have been born. Which is the fundamental claim now? So you're saying, are you saying that there's a paradox here? So, so the idea would be that if I am a fan, of, if I'm a vegetarian, I'm really saying two Let's go things. One step back. It's yeah. not that you're a vegetarian. Suppose you really value the quality of life of animals, and you're trying to decide whether to be a vegetarian or not. Okay. I think then you, what you have to say is. I favor a capitalist system that provides meat to consumers because I care about animals. Because it's nice that they're born and, and live their yeah. their um, bovine life for a while. It, and well, that, that's clearly true. I, I think it, it's very difficult to imagine anything else being true. They, they couldn't live on their own. Cattle would disappear very quickly if we didn't have some market for their meat. Well, you know, one of the flaws of this show is that sometimes we have people with strong opinions. So, I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play... V- and sometimes I have to play the, the strong opinion on the other side. I'm, I'm going to be the vegetarian. Uh-huh. Let, me, let me defend the vegetarian here, even though I'm a, I really like meat a lot um, and eat it with gusto. <laughs> so the vegetarian, I think, would argue, well, I'm not saying that, 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 they're, that animals – I'm not a utilitarian. All I believe is that I as a human being don't have the right to exploit animals. So if I'm going uh, – I'm, I'm totally happy with the world with their fewer cows. Uh, and because it, because it, the world where people eat cows, where there's lots of them enjoying their cowy life, that's just that's that's I don't have the right to do that. I don't have the right to even bring them into the world to use them as an object uh, for my pleasure. What do you think of that? Isn't that their argument? I think that's a legitimate. I, it, it argument. It is their argument. I, I have converted two utilitarians to eating free range meat. Now, see, the problem with the argument that I'm making is that it would say. You have to look into the actual conditions under which animals are actually harvested and sent to slaughter, which is the, the – we're getting back to the original question. If you look at that, it, it's pretty horrible. It's unnecessarily cruel. So why isn't there a middle ground where we say what we'd like to do is take cattle's lives with respect, recognizing that they're better off to have lived in a nice way, and then we'll, we'll eat them. Well, let me just mention Temple Grandin. Temple Grandin is uh, uh, an autistic woman, yeah. I think self-described. 
well, that way. But she, this is the poster child. And she has evidently has the ability to be more empathetic about what animals experience in terms of fear and anxiety. And she has chosen to devote much of her life to finding ways to treat animals as they enter the abattoir in ways that are uh, evidently, evidently, who knows, more compassionate. That with, do- with little or no increase in cost. Okay. And we got to, we didn't answer the question, which is the top down, bottom up thing. Do you, do you, we've, you've said some interesting things about vegetarianism and utilitarianism. Do you want to say anything about the market versus top down? Um, regulations would just raise cost. If you said you have to do this in a particular way, if what you did is say, <clears throat> I'm an entrepreneur, I'm going to find a way to appeal to customers who are willing to pay more for beef that has been well treated. And actually, some people claim in blind test tests they they can taste a difference because of the the enzymes and chemicals that are released in the frantic final few minutes of a cow's life compared to having it taken in a compassionate way. So I think there's a number of arguments for this. I don't know what the best way is. Regulation means we know in advance. Okay, well, we're we're out of time on this. I would just add a footnote to a recent article on The Atlantic about uh, food, which I'll put a link up to, uh, and about Alice Waters, written by Caitlin Flanagan. I wish I had time to talk about it. Let's move on. Um, Viking Vista asks, what is the – now, this 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 question I want to say in advance couldn't be answered even in an hour, but uh, we're going to give it, give you six minutes on it. What is the biggest deficiency in the study of economics today? Economics, to me, has moved more and more in a direction where they're studying economics instead of markets. It's become a kind of subfield of applied math, and in some cases, not very applied math. Adam Smith, when he wrote, and this actually is Adam Smith when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, was interested in the problem of what creates wealth, but it was a subsidiary question, because his earlier book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, was about the question, when is it moral to act in your own self-interest? Does morality require altruism, or sometimes can we act in our own self-interest? Now, where does wealth come from, and under what circumstances can you build a system for society where people acting in their own self-interest actually make other people better off. Those are really important questions, and modern economics doesn't look at either of them. Nope. Modern economics tends to look at what I would call the simplified invisible hand problem, and that invisible hand problem is not the one where someone acting in their self-interest is led to, to benefit others. The invisible hand is... Can we show that what economists call the first and second welfare theorems, we actually come up with if we have a a competitive market at work? And what those welfare theorems say is there's no way of making anyone better off in the results that we actually get from markets. But the assumptions that we make in order to prove those theorems, in order to prove general equilibrium, are absurd. Not only is it particular assumptions about competition, but assumptions about information knowledge. information and nonlinearity. So what it means is that you have decreasing returns to scale. Now, when I read Adam Smith, very early on, I encountered the example of the pin factory and entrepreneurship. What the pin factory says is if you divide these artisan tasks, if one guy making pins, he can't make very many, and it takes a lot of skill. If you divide it into 18 different tasks, you get a whole lot of pins. No one has needs to have very much skill. And now we get exchange and trade. But that's increasing returns to scale. So economics should be about entrepreneurship, increase, increasing returns to scale, and the way that people actually go over the mountain and find new ways to trade with their neighbors. That's not what we do. We look at static situations and problems that we can solve. It, 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 the, the way I would sum it up is it's an old joke. <clears throat> that you've heard, but I, I think it's an insight. Guy comes out of a bar, sees a guy on his hands and knees looking for something under a street light. So he goes over and asks if he can help. And the guy says, yeah, I lost my keys. Okay, I'll, I'll help you look. Uh, where'd you see him last? And the guy on his knees under the street light points over into the dark and said, well, I saw it over there. And the, other, the guy who came out of the bar said, well, why aren't you looking there? And the guy says, well, the light is much better here. I can see better. I, I laugh inside it, it great, with great exuberance because it, it's too painful to e- laugh out loud. Economics looks in the place where the light is best, but markets are about the place that's dark, 
where entrepreneurship and innovation provides new information, new products. Economics doesn't look at that. So I'm going to cheat here. We're, we're three minutes into this question. I, I take your point, and I'm going to ask a different – this is a weird question. Um, you finished graduate school. You had a PhD. You went and got your first job. Of the stuff that you understand today about how the world works, what proportion of it have you gained postgraduate school? Is that a clear question? Yes. When, when you when the stuff of the world in the sense of, of studying economics, yeah. I was lucky to be at a place that had a pretty Chicago-dominated faculty. Lee Benham was the guy who taught industrial organization, and he had done a lot of work about uh, one of his famous papers. <laughs> was about uh, allowing advertising for eyeglasses and the problem of information and uh, licensing restrictions. And so when I read some of that literature, I started to go back into the work about transactions cost and uh, Alchin and Demsets and, and people whose idea of markets was different from what I had learned in my first year micro course. So I actually felt like I did know a little bit more in the sense that I was distrustful of, of much of mathematical microeconomics. And I was lucky enough, my first job was at the Federal Trade Commission, where we looked at industry regulation. I looked at airlines, I looked at uh, trains. And if you actually look at regulation in the way that the world works, I I'm going to call the Federal Trade Commission sort of a postdoc. If you'll give me that, I actually learned, I think, more than most economists get to learn about the way actual markets work. But it was because I wasn't a very good economist. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't good enough at math to do the sort of economics that everybody else was doing. Yeah, for me, I'd say the answer is about 50% plus. I learned a lot in graduate school about... You went to uh, Chicago, though. I went to Chicago, but it shocks me how much I've learned since then. Yeah. What's interesting is I'm not sure I could have understood what I understand now if I'd been taught it then, and it's not clear how to teach it. I think yeah. one of the biggest challenges we have going forward in undergraduate education and with what we do on the web and through this podcast is how do you teach people how to think like an economist? Uh, what's the right mechanism to get them to understand the and then what? To understand the unintended consequences, to understand the complexity of market processes. I think that's very hard to teach. You do absorb it in all kinds of mysterious ways. And I find that the most educational stuff that I've learned. And the last note I'll close with as we move on to our next question is, I think the biggest challenge we have in teaching undergraduates these lessons is that we have to give them a grade, which um, I think hampers education, ironically. You can, I'll give you 30 seconds so I'll rewind the clock to, to comment on that. Well, it, it, it means that we only give out questions where we think we know the answers because otherwise it's hard to grade. It's hard to grade. Almost all of my most interesting conversations with economists are at lunch saying, why is it that people sell used cars <laughs> Uh, with this sort of strange price discrimination. And then CarMax pops up, and it's, a, it's a, a different way of doing it, and they both exist. We don't know the answer to that. Fascinating. We've talked a little bit about it. Uh, next question. To what extent did Fannie Mae and other government-backed debt have uh, in creating the financial crisis? That's from David Williams. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a terrific question. I don't know that it's – it, it, it's interesting to try to compare different costs. I would say that the crisis could not have happened without Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So they were necessary, although perhaps not sufficient. The reason the crisis happened was the government set a trap. And the trap was baited with three kinds of tasty cheese. And the mice came up and were slaughtered in the thousands. So the, the, kind, the three kinds of tasty cheese were we subsidized down payments, which is a, a terrible idea. We, we had reducing, artificially low interest rates. Reducing the skin in the game that people had in their own house. It, it, it meant that, well, the, the thing about subsidizing down payments, it reduces the, the skin in the game and it takes away the power of the signal about does this person have financial wherewithal, can they manage financial resources. So for both reasons, the signal about other parts of my life and whether or not I have anything at risk. Second was artificially low interest rates. We've talked about that a little bit already. The third, and it maybe the most heinous, was the guarantee of permanent price increases. In effect, and you can find uh, interviews with Treasury secretaries going back 20 years, but, but uh, Secretary Paulson, I think in uh, 2006, said it was a market failure. Any decline in housing prices were a market failure, and government would act. That's what government does 
to solve market failures, we'd prevent that. Well, that, that, that seems rather odd. If you think housing prices are always going to go up, one of the first rules of finance is anything that's going to happen has happened already. If housing prices are going to go up, they already have gone up, but they're going to go up more. Anything I can do to get into a house is justified. Because it's so, appreciating and I can make money. Yes. But let, let, let's connect this back to, to Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac. The way it actually happened was Fannie Mae was created in 1938. Freddie Mac in, in 1970, and their job was something economists call intermediation. They, they find people who want to borrow money, and they find people who want to loan money, and they get them together and write contracts. The way that, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac did this was to try to put them in bigger packages, try to make it possible for loans to be resold. The problem with mortgages was that they were illiquid. They were they didn't trade very well as assets. Now, part of the reason for that was that it was risky to get the loan too far away from the house so that you had information about it. But that was what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were supposed to do. The big change happened in 1994, 19, between 94 and 97, where the definition of a loan, you can't see me, but I'm making air quotes, that was conforming. So a conforming loan had always been you required at least 20% down, which could not be borrowed, and a 30% ceiling on monthly mortgage payments as a proportion of income. They dropped both of those. Now, maybe nothing down, maybe 100% of your monthly income could be devoted to your mortgage, and yet that was still a conforming loan in the sense that it was, it was stamped with the government stamp of approval because Fannie Mae would buy it and then resell it at full par value, just like nothing had changed, which meant that the Sisters of Mercy Orphanage could buy it as if it really were a AAA asset. This wasn't, an, this wasn't a risky investment. This was government certified. Yeah, let me just add two parts to that, which I think, which I think, uh, which I think were important. Uh, the reason this happened in between 94 and 97 is that the government through HUD, uh, Housing and Urban Development, created mandates for Fannie and Freddie to give something back. They were making a lot of money. Yeah. And they wanted Fannie and Freddie to do something uh, for uh, social justice. So what they did is they required Fannie and Freddie to start devoting a particular proportion of their business to borrowers who had income below the median in their area. More than ever before. And they started to raise that proportion over time steadily between 94 and 2006. Uh, so it was a Clinton administration initiative that yeah. the Bush administration um, – embraced as yep. part of the ownership, society the ownership society claim. So that was one – That's and by the way, Fannie and Freddie, uh, their lobbying effort is widely respected as one of the most powerful on Capitol Hill. So you have to ask, well, why would they let this happen to them? Why would they want to be required to buy all these higher risk loans? And the answer was because they were making a lot of money from them. Uh, the government implicitly guaranteed – this is the other piece of the puzzle – the government implicitly guaranteed – uh, the value of those bonds that you're talking about, the yeah. securities. And so investors poured money into them knowing that they were – not knowing, but expecting them to be uh, taken care of by the government. And despite the fact that the quality of the loans in those packages got riskier and riskier, people kept pouring money into them. They, 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 at, at, at one point in 2006 and 2007, there was $20 billion with a B in new CDOs, those big packages, every quarter. So the, the farm more than, than that, ever actually. been in history were, was being sold every quarter. The money just poured into this. And it, what happened was real housing prices for the past 50 years had been between about 140000 and 160000 If you adjust for inflation, it was a good hedge against inflation. But the reason was that you bought a house, you stayed in it for 30 years, and once it was paid off, you had an asset that it appreciated at about the rate of inflation, maybe a little more. That's the first stair on the steps to the American dream. But what people were doing now, once we start pouring this money in, we destroyed affordable housing because the, the average price went up just between 97 and 2004 to $250,000. So it went up from $150,000 to $250,000 in real terms. Nothing like that had ever happened before. That's why it looks like a bubble. And we're out of time, but um, it wasn't animal spirits. Although no, animal, was, spirits, was, animal spirits played a role because once they start appreciating, it can be rational to be exuberant about them. Yeah. But uh, 
the thing that stoked the fire was, uh, I think, bad government policy. Yeah, it, it, an obviously bad government policy, even though you can see why they would do it. It's a trap. If we can get more people in houses, they'll be better off unless they default. Yeah. Uh, uh, the road to somewhere is paved with good intentions. Uh, next question uh, comes from uh, John Strong. <clears throat> It has always seemed to me that a social order with free competition requires a high order of cooperation, much higher, in fact, than a social order where competition is restricted. Do you agree with that? Interesting thing about this question is it makes you think about what is meant by cooperation. And there's at least two different kinds of cooperation. One is I act in a way that advances your goals because of the way the system is set up. And we get used to this kind of tacit coordination or cooperation where we help each other, but we still get what we want. Another kind of cooperation is where we have a meeting and we assign people tasks, and then we actually all go out and do them, even though no one's watching, because we care so much about the organization. So families cooperate that second way, well, sometimes. Sometimes I'll tell my son to mow the lawn and I'll come back and it still won't be mowed and he'll be gone. Strange, <laughs> strange phenomenon. Yes. How how do we explain that? It's a puzzle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you told well, him? So the, 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 he was the, there? He heard you? But some people, some people do cooperate in private groups. There's no question about that. Mansur Olson, when he talked about the, the free rider problem, also noted many organizations are able to solve this. But the, the thing is, there's really two really different kinds of cooperation. And again, let me go to the experimental literature to try to, to, to think about this, kind of reason through it. If you do what are called dictator games, and the, the, let me explain what a dictator game is. There, there's, there's two of us. Let's say you and I are playing. I go first, and I suggest well, there's $100 on the table. I'll suggest a split. I get $60. You get $40. You go second, and you either veto or accept. If you veto, we both get zero. If you accept, we get the split that I proposed. And so if it was 60-40, you're thinking, well, if I accept, I get 40. If I say no, I get zero. And let's see, 40 is bigger than zero, so rationally, I should accept. Well, not only should you accept 40, you should accept if I one. say 99-1. <laughs> yeah. If I say 99-1, and I, knowing that you're rational, would, would propose 99-1. So the prediction for an economist is everybody always proposes 99-1 if they're in my position, and everyone always accepts if they're in your position because one is bigger than zero. Well, lo and behold, that's just not at all what you find if you actually run these experiments. People are pay a price for fairness, and it's something more than a dollar. So if you think of it from the perspective of the second person, they're saying, this, what a jerk this guy is. Will I pay a dollar to deny him 99 because he's being a jerk? Yes. Well, I pay two dollars if he proposed ninety-eight to two. Well, the interesting thing is that if you go in uh, Western Europe or the United States, Canada, places that are used to markets, that are used to cooperating, even though they don't know the other person, and you put them in a setting where they can't see a picture of the person, they don't know who they're dealing with, so it's purely anonymous. Most of the time, they'll propose 55, 45, 60, 40, something pretty close or to 50, even. Or 50-50 even, I yeah, say. Or 50-50, something either very close or exactly an even split, even though they don't know the other person. If you go to a society that depends on that second sense of cooperation, families, personalistic relationships, clans, they always propose 99-1, and the other guy will always say no. And the weird thing is, Sometimes you see that three or four times. The hmm. one guy is making a threat. I'm saying 99-1. The other guy says no. They both get zero, and they stay at that zero-zero because they're not used to impersonal cooperation. Impersonal cooperation, which is what markets are, is a difficult thing to get into people's mind. But once it's there, you actually get far more cooperation because it can be done cheaply and easily than you do if you're depending on the explicit kind of cooperation where my son doesn't mow the lawn. Well, I suspect there are other factors beyond the experience of a market <laughs> economy uh, that causes maybe those results to differ. But but I think it's a very deep point, and I, I want to digress on it for a second or maybe 120 seconds, which is about what we have left. If you um, if you go to, to countries that did not have market-based uh, systems very, very – much market activity, so the former Soviet Union being an obvious example, 
you hear a lot of stories about life in the both in the old days and in the relatively new days of semi-market behavior where people uh, don't have much trust and exploit each other, take advantage of each other in situations. I think I've told the story in here of the guy who planned a conference in the Soviet Union uh, and right before it was about to start was told he could only have half as many rooms as he uh, expected. And he says, well, we had a contract. And the guy says, so sue me. Yeah. I got a better offer. Yeah. And in America, that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Uh, that kind it, of opportunity. It happens, but it doesn't it happen very often. And one of the reasons it ha- doesn't happen is that people would feel like – you'd feel like a jerk if you were that opportunistic. Now, sometimes yeah. the cost of not being opportunistic is high enough that you'll be opportunistic. But most people in that setting don't exploit the other person. Uh, I think in, in societies that are top-down, that are corrupt, uh, they struggle with that level of trust. And we have a great advantage in America – I worry it's disappearing, especially in wake of the uh, the bailouts. Yeah, I see people no who responsibility. Yeah, people play by the you play by the rules of the game, yeah. and you you're a sucker. But th- what a great point that is, Russ. And I think it's something we haven't heard very much. Markets are fragile because they actually rely for low transactions cost contracts to be executed, where you don't have to sue on people being able to trust each other, and it, that's more fragile than you might think. Yeah, the rule of law isn't really what sustains uh, capitalism. The rule of law is it, – it's crucial, but you, it's great that we have a relatively low cost – a relatively low cost way of enforcing that. Yeah. You don't want to use the legal system for that. You want it, It's for last resorts. Um, here's a, a basic economics question that comes from Dave. Can you tax a business or is it passed on to consumers? As far as I'm concerned, the sort of complete and really great answer to this question uh, was done by Alfred Marshall in his book on the principles of economics, and that's available on the the Liberty Fund site on the online Library of Liberty. Let me give the the, the simple answer. Um, The question is, can you tax a business or is it passed on to consumers? It, It depends on two things. If it's a tax on income, suppose we tax the profits of the business. That looks like it shouldn't have many distorting effects because we're just saying, well, this is a excess profits tax. After it, the fact, we're just going to take a little slice. Yeah. And, and the more you make, the more we'll take. But you don't really deserve it. You, you have enough incentives. Well, it, it encourages overcapitalized production in the sense that instead of declaring profits, the company is going to plow all of its money back into uh, robots, uh, nice conference chairs, vacations for its uh, executives, maybe bonuses for its executives. So one of the reasons that we pay, we overpay executives and we have robots instead of workers is that we have such, the United States has a relatively high taxes on corporate income. So the interesting thing is who pays the tax on, on income for corporations? The answer is workers. It, it, it increases the wages of a few skilled workers, but it reduces employment. And so it, it reduces the, the – first, it, re, it reduces the number of workers that we expect, and it, it makes people go overseas. It drives company overseas. So the, yeah, the, but doesn't it, doesn't it make the workers that remain more productive because they have more, more capital productive, to work with? That's right. So, so the, that doesn't the, hurt the, the few people who are working are better off because they're making higher wages. Now, they're, they're relatively skilled workers. So the, the, that's a, a very good point. It, it, isn't it paradoxical? that corporate income taxes hurt unskilled workers. The, Continue. The, 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 second, the second kind of tax is ad valorem, or sort of per unit tax on the sale of products. And here's what Alfred Marshall said about that. The general principle that if a tax impinges on anything used by one set of persons in the production of goods to be disposed of to other persons, the tax tends to check production. This you need to get that, less of it. it. It it shifts a large part of the burden on the tax forward onto consumers, and a small part <laughs> backward on those who supply it. So, generally, unless that the it's a what economists call perfectly competitive, but then maybe wheat. If we if we tax the sale of wheat, well, all of that would be passed forward to consumers because already tax the the people who grow wheat are just breaking even. But it also would be true if you put a tax on something like cigarettes, where it's not what economists call elastic. 
if if I put a tax on cigarettes, someone who uses cigarettes is still going to buy them. All of that's going to be passed forward onto consumers also. It's only the ones in between. It's only the ones where it's not competitive, but it's not like cigarettes, where the, the company, the producer, pays any of the tax at all. And so the, the distinction, and the reason this is a good question, the distinction is between who pays the tax in the sense of writes the check. And if you put a tax on business, they write the check. But generally, most of that tax is going to be passed on to consumers or to labor. So the incidence, the actual impact of the tax, is relatively rarely going to be on the business. The the larger society ends up paying it. Yeah, I think the technical answer would be it depends on the shape of the supply and demand curves rather than who writes the check. And I think understanding that is one of the values of a formal education in economics. Um, And I... I have a set of notes I'll put up a uh, link to where I, where I show that using a supply and demand in a way that's a little different than the standard textbook approach, and I find wow. it I find it more intuitive. I, I want to actually – I'm going to cheat and skip off this question for a sec. Uh, I may be one of the only people on the face of the earth who hasn't seen American Idol. Uh, I have seen the YouTube of – I had heard that there was one. I didn't know it was it's you. It's me. Uh, I have seen the YouTube of Susan Boyle on, on the show, which um, – um, she was on the British version, actually. She was on the British version. Yeah, you're so, not, you're not, this, this is very good. This is a this is a footnote. It's it's a yeah. It's the exception that doesn't prove the. I don't know. Anyway, so I've never seen the show, but I've seen Simon Cowell at various places. He's a very talented guy. He's the main judge. The news came out today, I think, or recently, that he's leaving American Idol. He's going to start his own show, and it's rumored that he makes thirty six million dollars for being on American Idol. I asked my wife what she thought he made, and she said, "Well, six hundred thousand. No, no, actually, it's." You're off by a little bit. It's thirty-six million. Well, he was the original producer, so it, it, it was his show that he created that he's now spun off. But what's fascinating to me is that I don't think anyone's outraged about that. Yeah. Uh, but they are outraged about Wall Street, and I think they should be because they're enjoying our money while they do it. And Simon Cowell, he's also enjoying our money, sort of, in that the source of the money is the people who watch the show and buy the products that are advertised. Uh, but it's totally different because one is a tr- somewhat really like a market process and the other one is rigged. Uh, and that's my cynical remark for the day. You have 60 seconds to respond to it. Isn't that an interesting incidence question? Because we don't actually pay Simon Cowell anything. What Correct. we do is we pay the producers of products who buy advertising and the, they buy advertising from television companies who buy shows from people like, people like Simon Cowell. So the actual incidence of the income is quite different from who pays. And it, it, it is just like that for taxes in the sense that the person who writes the check, if you say who pays the tax, you don't really care who writes the check. Thanks for saving my uh, digression. Let's move on. Uh, Russell Wood asks, how would a free market economist advise his own child about the value of attending college? Well, I'm, I'm in, a, I'm in a, a, a difficult spot here. Yes, you are, aren't you? <laughs> I've got my, my older son is a sophomore. And my younger son is a senior in high school. So he, we're deciding right now where he should go. There's three aspects to the college choice. There's three things you want. One is value added, which is education. One is signaling in the sense that you're saying, this is the sort of person I am. I'm college educated. And the kind of college you go to sends a signal about that. And the third is connections. The people that are in your dorm, not that they're in your classroom, that you're listening to at the front, who cares about the professors? You go to that kind of college where you make connections. You meet important people from your state. If you go to the state flagship university, you go to Harvard, then down the hall is the son or daughter of the president of some African country. Uh, So the the other thing, I guess, in parentheses, I would say is (laughs) people go to college to learn how not to become a jerk. And I was... I went to college, then I had to go to uh, get a master's and a Ph.D. It took me a lot longer than most people, but some people can manage it after they just get their bachelor's degree. Uh, that's a gr- I love that definition for why people go to graduate school. It takes them longer. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. It's, it, 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 I may have to go back again one more time. Well, I think you know the alternative is we have nothing productive to give to society, so it just delays our entry that much longer. It's a, well, it, that's certainly true in Germany. I saw... <laughs> Uh, When I was teaching in German, I think I said this before, that there's a lot of people in graduate school because Germany has figured out it's cheaper to pay people not to study than it is to pay them not to work. (laughs) As long as they're in school, they're not unemployed, so it's cheaper Uh, for the state. 
It's depressing. But the, the three real reasons that, that you go to college, if those are the things that you know, and the, the colleges offer different mixes of them. So you need to decide, do I care about the education? Do I care about the signal? Or do I care about the connections that I'm going to make? There's a lot of ways to cut cost. If you look at private colleges, they're, they're very expensive. But for, for that reason, they have a lot of value as signals. And they provide you with connections because there, there may be a lot of other people that you'd be interested in having your son or daughter hang out with and learn from in the dorm. So the interesting thing about this is I think there's no single answer. What I think you have to decide, and this is like saying which is better, chocolate or vanilla, part of it depends on taste. Part of it depends on your objective. So a free market economist would advise his own child to, to try to think, and with, with my help, of course, what is it I want to get out of this, and how much is it worth to pay for it? For a lot of people, if you're, if you're constrained on money, then taking AP courses in high school, taking courses during the summer, and thinking about how can I finish my undergraduate degree in four years makes a huge Unless, difference. Yeah. You can go to a, a top public college if you can get in and not spend very much money and get a lot of benefits from that by – trying to economize on the amount of time that you're there. So I'm teaching in George Mason, which is a, um, a state school. Uh, you're at Duke, which is a private school. Uh, I attended North Carolina as an undergrad, which is private. I attended Chicago as graduate school, which is private. I said North Carolina was private. It's public, obviously. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've And I've taught at lots of places as well. So I have a pretty good – mediocre, but better than many, experience of the different choices. One thing that you didn't uh, – two things I want to add to your to your list. Um, one is it's – to me, it's a lot more important what you study than where you go. Uh-huh. And it's some, more important that you study. Yeah, we'll get to that. That's my second point. I'll get okay. to that in a sec. Uh, what you study is more important than where you go in the sense that uh, although some places are really good for a particular subject, most of them are okay at, at most things. And what you choose as your major is, I think, very, very important. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's deeply undervalued is the ability to write. And I think most people leave high school unable to write, and if and they work really hard at leaving college unable to write, which leaves them greatly handicapped. So one piece of advice I would give is um, communicating in written form, verbally, in other ways, uh, even PowerPoint, although I don't use it because uh, it's usually abused. Well, but – Power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Uh, that's really important. And so I, I, to me, you know, I prefaced it with my resume because I think you know, being at a state school, it's easy to say it, it, it doesn't matter where you go um, as much as what you study. But I really think it's true based on my other experiences. Uh, the other point I would make, and this is my challenge to you, Mike, it seems to me – and so we're both a little bit compromised in answering this question – it seems to me that the educational component of college has fallen greatly. I recently received a paper I'll put a link up to that talks about uh, how little students spend studying today compared to 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, there's no doubt that the educational component of college has dropped dramatically. Uh, it's also clear to me that there are many, many better ways you could spend your time if your only goal was education than going to, to a modern college. Um, why is that? Is that? It's very depressing. People are emphasizing the signaling and connections part at the expense of value added. I think they're not doing it in an informed way. And in some ways, the incentives sort of go the other way. My, my son had uh, went to a high school where he could take the equivalent of three years of uh, college calculus. And I'll, to, to, just to finish the sentence. <clears throat> take two more. His, his high school guidance counselor said, you know, you've had enough math in high school. You don't have to take any in college. You can do other things. So I called and said that he had pretty clear talent for math. Why would you tell him that? And the high school guidance counselor said, well, I didn't really take any math, and I turned out okay. Uh, I, the, the fact is that the, yeah, a lot of the people <laughs> we have advising our students are not focused on engineering, science, on trying to accomplish uh, new things. We have a liberal arts mindset where it's a kind of finishing school where you learn how to play the piano and sing. Yeah. 
Uh, it strikes me uh, there is this other component called fun that I think drives most high school students' desire of where to go to college. And it does, I think, take up most of what has been uh, liberated by the reduction in studying habits. Uh, it's not playing the piano and singing. Yeah. Um, na- na- nature abhors a vacuum. Yes, so it does. Expands. Yes, it does. And uh, I think that would be one of the things on the list of many prospective students. Let's move on to question number nine, which comes from Marina. And I'm not going to do justice to her question, but I want to give uh, the flavor of it. Uh, she wrote me a very um, thoughtful email about the following phenomenon, which I think is a true phenomenon, although I don't know in any one instance how true it is. But the gist of it was this. There are many charities that collect um, money from donors uh, to fund cures for various uh, diseases, illnesses, problems, conditions, etc. And they tend to get focused on a particular strategy for curing, say, cancer or diabetes or heart heart disease. And if a maverick scientist comes along who has a different approach, which could be true, not necessarily, it's it's a long shot. Mavericks are usually wrong. It's every once in a while they're right. And, you know, a classic example of this would be the scientists who pushed uh, bacteria as the source of ulcers rather than anxiety and worry. You know, for a long time, people thought anxiety and worry cause ulcers. Uh, In fact, although they may contribute, uh, there's a bacteria. Uh, that causes ulcers. And so the scientists who propose the bacteria theory or uh, all the other scientists in history who have who have gone against the establishment, um, they're usually ridiculed. They're mocked. Uh, sometimes they're mocked and ridiculed because they're goofy and wrong, but sometimes they're mocked and ridiculed because they're a threat to the existing power structure within that charity or within that research uh, organization. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. It's a phenomenon we don't think about very often uh, that the charities, unfortunately, care about power and money uh, just like everybody else does. Well, the, the, the unfortunately part, I, I realize, is sort of an ironic thing on your part. They're, uh, they're, they're humans. And so our idea that they would not is strange. One of the first insights of public choice is that There's no moral transubstantiation that takes place just because someone leaves a market firm and goes to work for the government or for a nonprofit. They still have interests. They still act on those interests. But they care about people. They care about people and not profits when they work for a nonprofit. You can just look that up because it says so in their mission statement. It says so. Right. No, it's very clear. (laughs) Um, Thomas Kuhn – let me start by saying Thomas Kuhn in the, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions said that there's going to be a lot of resistance to new ideas. So some of this might just be the fact that the existing ideology is a, a, a sunk cost. It's an asset that we have uh, a lot of stake in. This is what we believe is the right way of thinking about it, and someone who wants to rethink it, just human beings are going to say, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. But there's something more going on here. Um, uh, reading the question, she gives a couple of examples of not just people disagreeing, but going on the attack and trying to attack their credibility, maybe spreading rumors, uh, trying to discredit them because they're a competing fundraising source. This is just no different at all than a private firm, uh, if if there's a new entry, uh, having to face the fact that they're going to be stuck with a a competitor and they're going to try to get rid of them. Does that have any relevance to the recent uh, revelations out of uh, University of East Anglia email uh, trove that suggested that perhaps uh, scientists involved in global warming studies were um, attacked, Uh, people who disagreed with them? Yeah, it it, it is interesting. You you might find that just from science. But in that case, there was a larger truth, something that Stephen Colbert called truthiness a truth that transcends mere facts. And there, what happened, and actually I'm sure some of these nonprofits felt like that too, they know that what they want is right. Now the individual facts might be a little inconvenient for now, and it does them big harm in a public relations sense. And so what they need to do is suppress these alternative facts because they're not really the correct one. They're true in some sense, sure. But they're inconvenient because we all know, in fact, as was said in those emails, and it's really difficult to explain why when when the uh, temperature should be going up, they appear to be going down. 
or as I heard a, a noted economist I won't name uh, recently on on a video on YouTube saying that that his model suggested that that there wouldn't be a global crisis if the U.S. housing market tanked, and since um, but he wasn't ready to give up on that yet. <laughs> he just needed to kind of. I don't know, rearrange reality. There, there I, might be some new facts that, that would come up. One of the things I find strange, this is a, another little digression here, I, I find it strange how cynical we've become as human beings. Our culture is so focused on uh, cynicism, irony. Um, you know, when, when you watch old newsreels and, and ads, you, you see how much our culture has changed and how skeptical we are and how cynical we are. And, and there's something really good about that. Uh, what I find fascinating is the parts of cynicism that that haven't grown yet. So, for example, people are cynical about government, but not their senator. Yeah. Cyn- cynical about business, but not science, because scientists are somehow I don't know. We have this romantic illusion about scientists and certain as some politicians, the people we voted for, whichever side of the aisle they're on. I find it fascinating. It's almost as if we have to have some inherent naive trust in some class of human beings. Well, whatever you think about President Obama, maybe you think he's doing a good job under difficult circumstances, maybe you think he's not, but there was a lot of that where people sort of transferred their hopes into a person who actually had very little experience and not a whole lot of knowledge about either economics or foreign policy because we want to trust people. There, there must be something that's important to human beings about having some kind of, of hope or trust, and we attach that to people who may or may not deserve it. It's actually interesting that we don't make more mistakes than we do. And that leads us to our last question. Uh, the last question uh, I'm going to ask of you, Mike, which is economy's not doing very well right now. We're at as we're taping this, we're at 10 percent unemployment, and that's with a falling labor force, which means the drop from 10.2 to 10 was because some people gave up and stopped looking, which is very depressing. Um, we have lots of challenges on the horizon. We have a massive deficit, a growing debt, uh, promises we've made for government entitlement programs that we will not be able to meet, an apparently dysfunctional political system. Uh, the list goes on, uh, and yet I remain somewhat optimistic about the future and the standard way that the future's thought about, I think, by most folks is uh, will your children have a better life than you will, uh, materially at least? Will our children, will the next generation uh, exceed its its par- the, the living standard of its parents? Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether you're optimistic about that. And I mean, of course, in general, not your extraordinary children who will easily <laughs> dwarf your uh, achievements. But um, do you think uh, America's – is our is our future dark or is it bright? One of the things that has made America successful is something we refer to, and I, you actually find this maybe more in other classes. When I taught at Germany this summer, we, they, one of the questions the students wanted to know about was, what is the American dream? What, is, what does it mean? And one definition of the American dream, the sort of central creation myth of U.S., the, not, not the political one, but the, the economic and family one, is that if I work hard and provide a house and education for my children, they'll be better off than I was. And so the reason that I'm, I'm going to sacrifice, the reason that I'm going to give time and read to my children is that they'll be better off, that the world over time gets better. And... You see that American dream at work some places. A lot of immigrants cer- certainly believe in it. The question is, do Americans believe in it? And what, what's going to be the implication of the apparent kind of falling away of that uh, optimism? Because I, I, I do think that many native-born Americans don't really feel it, whereas a lot of immigrants almost by definition do. They come here, they may not speak the language very well, they sacrifice, they work two jobs, they send their kids to school with the belief that they're going to hook on to that kind of rising level and they're going to achieve a middle-class lifestyle, whereas they couldn't have in, in their home country. That, that's what the, the act of immigration, almost by definition, implies. Well, the, the, the evidence on social mobility 
would say that in the U.S. there is less upward social mobility than there was even 20 or 30 years ago. People are born to a particular, uh, I, I guess you could call it class, but what I mean is income percentile. And more people than used to be now stay in something like the same income percentile or fall. And I wonder if some of the reason isn't a, a change in economics, uh, uh, forgive me, a change in education, where people don't work as hard because they're not as sure that the benefits are going to be there. They don't see as clean a relationship between work hard in high school and then start in a job where they're going to rise, maybe a manufacturing job. Suppose you live in Detroit. Uh, a lot of the jobs that people depended on to be the kind of escalator that slowly over time moves them up towards the American dream either aren't there or disappeared when somebody was 56. And now they have to look for another job. So that there's sense in the almost inevitability in the fact that if I work hard, I'll be rewarded. It's probably what's shaking that optimism. I'm going to disagree with you there. I, I think those data on mobility are really tricky to do correctly. And a lot of ideology plays a role in both sides, Who are those who say there's still lots of mobility and those who don't. I think you've also got the issue of relative versus absolute so that while you might be stuck within a, a, the same quartile or decile even or quintile, uh, the, all of them are moving up. Uh, I am shocked at how hard my children work in school relative to how hard I worked. Um, so I think there's this weird paradox going on. People say kids don't learn anything. They're lazy. All they do is sit around and play video games. And yet I think at least among educated folks – and this may be only true for them, but I don't think it's only true for those of us who are educated uh, or overeducated, as we might have mentioned earlier. Uh, our children work fanatically harder uh, on all kinds of things. Uh, yes, there are all kinds of dumbing downs and, and bad trends in American education, but I'm also struck with, with how hard a lot of students work, how much homework there is. Uh, some of it mindless, yes, but much of it uh, productive. So to me... In many ways, the American dream is easier than ever if you graduate from high school and go on to college and study something serious. You will thrive. I don't think we disagree then. And immigrants who come here and do that still move it. way up. So yeah. I think most of the mechanisms are still there. That's well, a different question. Well, that's, that's the one I'm answering. How's that? Well, no, but <laughs> what an interesting distinction. <clears throat> In some ways, it's easier than ever before to achieve something like the American dream if you work hard, there's so many opportunities. There's so many things that you could have. The computers are cheaper, all sorts of electronics, cars. By, by any sort of, of objective comparative standard, you are going to be better off than your parents were if you just work for it. What worries me is a number of young American young people don't feel that way, and they don't work for it. So although the mechanisms are there, I worry that we're going to be divided into two cultures, those who did work and who did get an education, and then those who didn't for whatever reason. Fair enough. Uh, l let me actually close with a different point which and get your reaction to will end there. And I do want to encourage everybody who's listening to drop, drop us a, a note at mail at econtalk.org as to whether you like this format or not. If you did, maybe we'll do it again. If you hated it, uh, we won't. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, I want to say that in advance as our six minute ends, but six minute ends. But I want to just say one last thing about this issue of of the future and the American dream. To me, what makes America special and what makes capitalism special is not its material success. It is the extraordinary opportunity it gives people to pursue their dreams, uh, whatever those dreams are, whether they're vegetarian, whether they're meat oriented, whether they're musical, whether they are entrepreneurial whether they are just to sit and, and have a quieter life or a loud life or an adventurous life. What markets do when they work and when they're allowed to work is they give people the opportunity to be spontaneous in the most beautiful sense of the word, to, to choose their path in life if they make the investment in the education that we're talking about and, and if they work hard and if they strive. And uh, to me, the great thing about markets that I – try to capture in my book, The Price of Everything, is that there is no weaver of dreams. There's no one whose responsibility it is in a capitalist system to make sure that the dreams fit together. And yet, in America, most of them fit together incredibly well. 
We don't fight over stuff. There's an incredible amount of harmony in a market system that our plans intersect with each other's in peaceful ways. And that's not the way it is throughout history in non-market-oriented systems. Non-market-oriented systems are about grasping and zero sum, and ours are about dreaming and creating. And that, to me, is what makes our country spectacularly special, both in time and place. And what I worry about is the rising role of government in deciding who wins and who loses. It's always been true, of course. There's always privilege. But in America, historically, there's been much less privilege. I worry about Wall Street in its recent grasping of privilege. I worry about Detroit in its grasping of privilege. And I worry about our ability to unwind that. I think we will, but I worry about it. What are your thoughts? I, that's certainly exactly what I worry about. I would celebrate the same things that you celebrate. Maybe just I'm a, I'm a little more worried. <clears throat> I wouldn't blame government for it. I would blame voters. Yeah, We're getting the government that we're asking for. I, I don't think that people appreciate how remarkable our institutions are, partly because our institutions are more informal. People think about the Constitution and the rule of law. Those are great. I'm big fans. But what, what really is interesting is the set of informal institutions we have, the market institutions, the educational institutions, that give people a chance more fully to realize their dreams than any other place or time in history. And we, we want to mess with it. We want to try to regulate it and, and change it from the top down. That gets rid of its genius. Well, I guess the claim of the other side would be, well, we have to do that because otherwise only the, the elites get their chance. But the data suggests otherwise. No, the more regulation we have, then the more likely we are to shunt people into positions that they already have occupied because it becomes a kind of caste system. So how do we get voters to be more... Um... Trust of Maybe system. we could do a series of podcasts. I'm all for that. Uh, let's do this again. It was a pleasure. My guest today has been Mike Munger. Mike, as always, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Let's talk again soon. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.